Uh, hi. Uh, so just to explain, uh, so we will have also one more person joining from Kansas City. We are still waiting for him to appear. Uh, so this camera is not recording. It's just for him to uh, see you when 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 he comes. Um, just so that you understand. Great, and thanks for coming. Uh, I'm Jenny, uh, and the purpose of this session is not so much to get really deep into the technical aspects of mesh networking, although we will cover some of that, but more to kind of elucidate how to go about building community-owned networks um, through telling our own stories of networks in Oakland, Slovenia, Portland, and Kansas City. So uh, maybe we can go down the line. You can intro first. Hey, my name is uh, Mark Jewell, and um, I work in the Oakland Mesh Network, uh, mostly on the firmware side of things. And I've um, been working on this for uh, a bit over a year now, uh, and getting ready to, to launch production soon, hopefully. I'm Jenny. I'm also in Oakland, uh, where we've started a group called Pseudomesh, uh, launching the People's Open Network. Um, my background, personally, is uh, in academia, anthropology and communication, but uh, I dropped out of academia because I was tired of researching the revolution and wanted to build it. So. Hi, my name is Mitar. I am uh, from WLAN Slovenia, which is a mesh network in Slovenia, which is a small country in Europe. Uh, and I'm presenting here uh, like a, a network with 360 nodes, currently. So uh, I'm Russell Sr. I'm the president of the Personal Telco Project, which is a community wireless network uh, here in Portland. Uh, there's uh, perhaps less community than we'd like and uh, probably less network than we'd like. And you know, maybe some of you people could help rectify that. Thank you. Great. So um, to begin with, what is a mesh network and why are they important? Um, my favorite image, oh, we just skipped past it, sorry, sorry. is uh, this is Grumpy Cat. This is from a, a protest post Snowden revelations in, in Berlin, I believe. I'm not really sure. It's, I can't actually find the origin of this uh, image. The pirate pirate the mm -hmm. Yeah. Uh, and um, so one of the reasons is, uh, is to build autonomous, uh, decentralized networks that um, can be resilient unto themselves. Mesh networks are point to point uh, networks in which every node is connected to every other nearby node that it can connect to. Um, making it resilient um, in the event that some of the nodes break down or uh, in the case of uh, censorship that you would still have an independent uh, network, local network. Uh, and what's exciting about community uh, mesh networks is, uh, is that it's a process of really building um, a commons-based infrastructure uh, for the people and by the people. That's what's exciting to me, and I think to most of us about this. Um, and uh, some of the use cases, you can go to the next slide. Uh, this is an image of uh, tide pools map um, post uh, the Superstorm Sandy uh, in New York. Um, and uh, this is an application designed to run on a mesh network uh, that was deployed um, with some extra features uh, in the wake of the storm. Uh, for folks, first responders to send SMS texts uh, identifying needs in the neighborhood, such as a uh, generator here or water supply here. Um, so this is one of the ways in which a uh, mesh network can be used as a tool in the wake of uh, uh, disasters that would wipe out communications infrastructure. And um, this is uh, an image of uh, the Church of St. Luke and St. Matthew, which served as a hub uh, in Brooklyn after the storm for people to come and bring uh, donations and supplies and coordinate volunteers and uh, kind of use this image to go back mm -hmm. <laughs> to elucidate um, the the as the essential nature of uh, a digital network um, being built in tandem with the existing community uh, infrastructure so churches schools coffee shops libraries um, and hacker spaces. You can go to the next. Um, and uh, this, this is an image of, I think, only about a third of all hacker spaces worldwide. Um, pseudo, pseudo mesh uh, in Oakland, in particular, works out of Pseudo Room, a uh, hacker space we co founded down there, which serves as a, as a great uh, hub for storing equipment and 
putting on classes and workshops and just meeting in general um, and is uh, uh, part of the larger movement towards um, building a community owned infrastructure. to Chris a little bit of uh, oh my goodness I'm not I'm not sure that's even accurate anymore but um, we have a, a network of a roughly a hundred nodes scattered around uh, the Portland metropolitan area um, uh, we have approximately 50,000 users a year um, and uh, some of them are in uh, some of our networks are in businesses and some of them are on individual people's houses um, so this is here's a picture of us uh, up on uh, just off Mississippi Avenue in North Portland some time ago um, uh, installing a piece of equipment that linked that house and the surrounding houses back to the rest of our network and to the uh, the internet um, so th this is an example how uh, the net uh, the network in Slovenia looks like. So the um, because the network is built organically by volunteers, uh, you can see in, on this map you have both uh, green nodes, which are the active nodes, and the red nodes, which are the nodes which at some point were active. So somebody maybe tried it out, decided um, um, that's not interesting, or for some other reason uh, it's not currently active. Uh, so you know it's really organic; it grows everywhere. Um, and, and it's like around 300 active nodes uh, currently, um, and then much more also others. Um, what I would like to just uh, showcase as an example also in, 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 in mesh network, which I think is very important, is that they're not only technical, te technical um, communities or technical projects, but you can really involve very wide range of people. For example, uh, here you can see in Milan Slovenia, we try to um, paint our antennas so that they are beautiful, not gray, boring antennas. And, and that's an amazing way how to you know, engage other parts of, of wider community of, of hacking and, and artists and, and others. So let's see if he's around. <laughs> yeah. I can speak on behalf of Isaac, I suppose. Um, and uh, this is also part of the inspiration for um, why I got interested in mesh networks um, and wanted to start a project in Oakland. Um, in uh, late 2011, uh, when Occupy began in Zuccotti Park in Manhattan, um, one of the essential infrastructure tools was uh, the Freedom Tower that the Free Network Foundation built to provide uh, Wi-Fi to the, to the park and to the surrounding area. Um, and. Uh, from, from this uh, sort of seed, uh, uh, Isaac went on to uh, help start the Kansas City Freedom Network in Kansas City, which at that point in time, I believe uh, late 2012, um, had uh, Google Fiber coming in. And uh, uh, there was a strong community interest in building an alternative to Google Fiber, um, to building a community owned and operated alternative. Uh, so they're working with a couple of organizations, Connecting for Good, uh, who are already embedded in the community and working on digital divide issues. Uh, so also a great example of, uh, of the, the need to um, create partnerships with existing community organizations who are already rooted in the neighborhood and uh, tackling different issues uh, that are all interconnected. Um, do you want to talk about Sudamash? Yeah, so uh, Sudomesh started, um, how long ago now? A bit more than a year? A year and a half. A year and a half. Mm -hmm. um, and we decided that we wanted to, to roll our own firmware for our routers. Um, uh, we, there's a lot of, of mesh groups out there. There's a lot of groups that have done this in different cities, and I think we'll get more into that. But um, we decided we wanted to do things just a little bit differently, and we decided also for the sake of learning how all this works, we're kind of going to take different components and put them all together and make it all work ourselves. And um, we have, uh, right now, we have a few, maybe like 30, 40 nodes deployed that are in testing. And we're having, we're having some problems. We're having some crashes. But that's why we have a testing phase. So, so uh, right now, uh, we have, we had a developer launch. And we got people 
to adopt nodes. We, we got crowdfunded a bit of money, and we got people bought some nodes from an eBay auction and flashed our firmware on them, and then we gave them to people who were willing to commit to helping us debug, who had some amount of network knowledge, who were like some of the local geeks interested in this, and um, and that's what we're doing right now. We uh, we're trying to figure out where why things aren't working when they stop working. We're getting error reports, and um, the next step will be to uh, to be able to uh, sell routers to people who don't know anything about mesh networking, but are just excited about it. An image of us mounting our first node. That map that you saw before um, is a, a node shop map, which is developed by the Italian mesh networking group Ninix, um, that we use uh, as sort of a starting point. When people say they're interested in hosting a node, we tell them to go to the map and just add their location to that map. So a map is largely comprised of potential locations currently. Um, but there's all sorts of uh, skills necessary in order to get a network off the ground. And I was just thinking today that we should reach out to rock climber types and circus folks to help us with some of the mounting uh, aspects. Can you just add something? So um, just here, just for um, background, uh, you can see like um, uh, presentation of networks at different stages. Like you, you can see very uh, an old network which started very early in, in Wi-Fi era where it just, you know, the Wi-Fi was very new and nobody knew what exactly it is and, and it was important to uh, spread this information that, you know, the Wi-Fi should be free, the internet should be free and so on. And then here is some, I would say, middle mesh a network which started uh, <coughs> later on where there are other net mesh networks so we could like look up to them and, and learn and, and innovate the next step and here you can see uh, um, very a baby mesh, uh, baby mesh <laughs> which uh, you know community <laughs> trying to build the new thing and I think it's very important here that you can then when you're think, thinking or may, maybe later on have questions you can then think you know on which layer you want to, to understand more about mesh. The next slide is, so we're, we'll show some slides of uh, other networks around the world because um, the other uh, hugely supportive and inspirational aspect of this project is the global community that it ties you into. Um, this is a photo of uh, some folks from Altermundi in Argentina. And you can tell you're in Argentina because you can see the mate gourd uh, being supped in the background there. Um, and. Uh, I think you, you visited them mm -hmm. a couple of months ago, yes? And uh, the next slide is uh, one of um, folks from Commotion uh, working on a project in India. I'm not sure exactly where this is, uh, but Commotion is a US-based project, um, actually backed by the State Department, um, that uh, is working to develop a basic, basically a plug-and-play mesh networking um, uh, firmware platform, um, still based on OpenWRT and, and OLSR is the routing protocol, and they're working on building some community networks in the U.S. Uh, as well as uh, in the Middle East and India, other places. So um, we want to talk about some of the challenges of uh, of getting wide adoption in mesh networks. And one of the things that we talked a lot about when we were starting and when we still talk a lot about with pseudo mesh is that how are we gonna how are we gonna get it, make it really easy for people to join the network and how are we gonna make it interesting and safe for people to join the network, people who may not be very technically skilled. Um, and there's uh, there's a different there's different kinds of ways that we do this. And um, one of the ways we do this is we provide like a really easy and cheap entry level uh, into the into the mesh. And we're not doing this yet, by the way. We're this is all plans. Um, but we um, Slovenia and other other groups have done similar things. So um, we we're planning to have three sets of uh, three types three types of routers. The really cheap indoor router won't actually reach out to anyone else. It will probably, unless you're in an apartment complex and there's someone just on the other side of the wall, it won't have enough range. But, and so why is that exciting to have a node in a mesh that's not actually meshing? Well, it's exciting because um, it's, first of all, it's cheap. Second of all, we have, in the framework we build, the ability um, for people to share the internet safely. And 
sharing internet safely means that uh, it goes through a VPN and the bandwidth is limited. So if anyone uses to do illegal stuff, they don't hear about it. We get the abuse complaints. They don't have to deal with it. If, uh, if someone tries to use all their bandwidth, they can't because the people who own the node gets to send, set a bandwidth limit. And that, even before the mesh, that's exciting enough for people to be interested because people want to share their internet. They just don't know how to do it safely. So providing a device that's cheap that does that. And then the other thing it does, the tunnel, the VPN tunnel, allows them to connect to the internet, to the mesh over the internet. So they get access to mesh services, like Danny was talking about um, the mapping. Um, there, there will be other services running and anyone can launch their own mesh service. And then, then once you get excited about it and you've had this thing for a while, you can, you can upgrade, you can get a better piece of equipment, maybe you can add an antenna, I know Villa Slovenia does that. You can add an antenna and then cover the entire, maybe the, the people who live across from you, and maybe the entire block. Um, but we're going to have uh, these three different levels where you can start with an indoor node, then you can have a node on the outside of your building that maybe covers the street more, and then you can go all the way and say, well, I want a really high-speed link into the mesh, so you get a point-to-point -point node on your roof that can do like maybe 100 megabits uh, and actually be better than your normal internet connection. But that requires mounting on the roof, so that's a little scary to new people. So what are we have here? Um. Oh, yeah. Um, yeah, I wanted to talk a little bit about um, automation automation of uh, mm -hmm. and how if we really want to scale out and, and get a lot of, of adoption without having to configure every single node, we're going to have to automate a lot of this stuff. And so um, we've been working on a system where you, you take a router, like out a new router out of the box, and you see people order them online, and you see the order in the queue of orders, and you just plug the router into a, a magic Ethernet plug hooked up to our server it gets flashed and it gets configured. The people already chose how much internet they wanted to share when they ordered the router. And it prints a little sticker. This is one of our the stickers. And actually, I'll pass around one of the routers with the sticker on it <laughs> so people can see. And it just has a little bit of, so these are one of the street level routers that we're using, so like the in-between level. Um, and uh, you see that there's some basic info there that uh, if people forget what the, what the router is about, they can still look it up. For, actually, for these routers that are outdoors, we put it on the power supply, and, and then uh, when they, they find it, they don't unplug it, and like, what the hell is this power supply doing here? <laughs> <laughs> uh, and uh, the idea is, what we haven't implemented yet is that we also want to print a little like getting started guide for how to do uh, all this. So that it should take no more than like five to 10 minutes, most of it waiting time, to flash a new node and ship it. And uh, we're pretty close to, to having that work. Um, so the question I think is, is, is how you start everything. Um, so the approach we are presenting here is something we, we um, something I think is, is most suitable for areas which have mixed, mixed, um, um, like in cities where you have mixed spa uh, areas where there is good in inter connectivity, internet connectivity already, and then areas which is maybe lacking that or is too expensive or 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 something uh, some other reasons why people cannot uh, connect. Um, and and you can really um, explain um, two stories to them. So one story is you have internet and and because you can if you have internet, why don't you share it? You know, like you, are, all you of you who are currently here, uh, you have internet home probably, but you are not using it at this moment. So if you open this and, and share part of that with everybody else around, and if everybody or enough of us do this all around the city, wherever we will go, we will have free internet access. That's you know, that's something which is appealing to people. And and like in WLAN Slovenia, this is something which which uh, triggered, um, uh, like I would say, um, chain reaction of people start doing that. Um, of course, the other side you have people who cannot connect. It's sometimes it's rural areas, sometimes even areas inside of the city who I don't know for different uh, reasons uh, are not served very well. But because you have other parts of city which are sharing the internet, you can then connect that together. Um, why is maybe here interesting that we are talking about internet sharing and not so much mesh networking? Because the mesh networking is hard to understand. It's something which we here maybe understand why it's important to have autonomous network, why it's important to own the equipment, why it's important to operate your own networks. 
but it is not something which is easy to explain. It's not something which is easy to encourage people and so on. Even even today with NSA, you know, we didn't found people ma marching on the streets wanting mesh networking. Why? You know. Uh, so uh, it is important to have multiple stories for different people, and and mesh networks allows those multiple stories. You can come and out and say, hey, it, mesh networking allows you safe. Internet sharing allows you independence, allows you censorship resistance, and so on. Um, but so the important thing here is to understand you have to have these different stories because it is important to create a critical mass of users. Without a critical mass of users, you don't have a mesh. Only one node is not a mesh. Even two friends having uh, one connection is not a mesh. So it's important to have mass, and for mass, you need massive people. Um, so that's that's uh, important to have in a sense. So you need first network to have mesh network, and of course, um, um, so one of solutions, uh, as, uh, as we mentioned already, is so that they provide um, um, uh, also internet sharing, safe internet sharing, uh, that they uh, provide uh, uh, traffic limiting on on VPN, so people can decide how much internet they want to share and so on. And of course, at the same time, they also do the mesh. If they see the neighboring node, they connect with that over Wi-Fi. But they also connect to that through VPN. So, yeah. What technologies are you using to connect to the internet that you're talking about? Do you, do you like, make a VPN tunnel between the meshes and have anchor points and then those meshes can properly? So, um, uh, mostly like in, in mm -hmm. one... the question, too. Oh, yeah, sorry, yeah, for also mm -hmm. for going. So the question was um, what we are using to connect uh, different meshes together. So uh, how we see this is that the whole network, the whole seat is one mesh. So you have maybe different parts of wireless mesh, but then those parts, few of those nodes in this one mesh connect with uh, a tunnel to the, to the one of more VPN servers to which also others are connecting. So in fact, all those is the same network. All these nodes, if you connect to them, you uh, connect to the same network. Of course, some of those uh, connections are wireless and some connections are, are tunnels. But from the user perspective and also from the routing protocol perspective, there is no difference. And because the main idea is that in this way you can bootstrap those nodes on different parts of the city at the same time. You don't have to coordinate everything with volunteers from one point, which is very really hard to find at the right moment at the right location of volunteer who want to put the node. But randomly around the city, it's, it's doable. People you know, jump in and so on. So with tunnels, you allow them to join immediately. You don't have to wait and say, hey, sorry, we cannot connect to you now. Wait for neighbor first to connect so that we connect. That does, doesn't work, you know. So yeah. if you immediately can provide VPN tunnel, they provide. And then the idea is, as the grow network grows, it gets more and more dense. And then at some point, you really have the, also the wireless independent network. And it's even true that sometimes then after the users join with tunnel, they want immediately also wireless. So they can invest more and create a backbone Long, longer distance link to some hill or some other location and also connect wireless. And then at the end, you have like three layers. You have on the top this backbone, five gigahertz of them connections between nodes, then the mesh network on 2.4, which connects with neighbors, and then uh, tunnels over the internet, which, which makes everything robust. So, and then you have all these three layers, and even if one layer fails, it will still have two others. Um, thank you. <laughs> Sai just moved in the way. <laughs> <laughs> so do, do, you want, do you have anything to add, or do you want me to just explain the uh, diagram? Again? Yeah. So I've, this is our, what we were already talking about, but maybe I can just point at this diagram real quick. So these will be like the 2.4 gigahertz uh, nodes, like the one that was passed around. That people have in their homes on the outside of their homes, and there are some nodes here, and they are close enough to talk to each other with Wi-Fi. And one of those nodes has a, a 5 gigahertz uh, rooftop point-to-point -point node is connecting to another part of the city where there are others are also some uh, 2.4 gigahertz uh, street-level nodes. And then uh, some of these have internet connections. It's four, and they connect to servers on the internet that route the traffic. Um, these uh, relays, they uh, route the traffic uh, between different parts of the mesh. And then we have, finally, an exit gateway to the internet. Um, right now, we only have one, but hopefully we'll get more in the future. and. Uh, one of the problems with running this is not a very big problem right now because in bandwidth is cheap, but bandwidth costs money. So someone has to pay for all internet bandwidth. It basically has to be paid for twice because everyone is already paying, paying for their, all, their own connections at home, and then you have to pay for it on a server. But bandwidth for servers is cheap, so it's not, it's not a huge deal. Um, 
Uh, and do you want to? Well, I think you should talk. About I, I was just going to <laughs> ask how many people here live in Portland. Okay, so I have a couple of questions. Who here would be interested in sharing their network? Awesome. Call me or email. We got stuff. Okay, we do slight, uh, slightly different than what they've described. We do have um, mostly our network is is. Uh, standalone hotspots, we have a few meshes, and we've certainly, we're not against mesh, but we've had found it difficult for exactly the reasons he's described. We don't have the density to get, um, you know, to make the links that we would need to do. Uh, but we have a, you know, a virtual mesh through VPN tunnels. So who's interested in, like, building uh, a mesh link to somebody? Awesome. That's, that's amazing. Well, yeah. okay. That's, that's <laughs> we can just start after after yeah. this after this session. Yeah. I think we should just get together and <laughs> and make work session and con co collect contacts and make a add to main list yeah. and start doing it. You know? So, um, so yeah. So so to describe a bit more of also techno uh, st technical stack, we would uh, now also talk a bit ab about this. So that's the point. Like different networks have different. Stacks, and that's also an uh, important part of everything. Is you know learning about all these technologies, and 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 um, uh, so there is no one solution. So what we are presenting here are like different variations on the team, and you know the important part is you know try it out, learn what what works for you. So okay, so um, this is the the what you get when you log into our first version of our the, the Oakland firmware. Um, I just I just briefly wanted to talk about how how we put together a firmware. It, all these firmwares, the people, all the firmwares that people use that they flash themselves are based on this Open WRT, which is um, it's a free and open operating system that's specifically made for routers. Um, the Open WRT uh, has a bunch of packages included. For, for different kinds of meshing protocols. And uh, we're using one called Batman Advanced, which is uh, was developed in, I believe, Berlin, at least in, uh, in Germany. And uh, I don't want to get like too technical here, but it, it has, it's interesting because it has some nice advanced features, and it works at, a, at the second layer, layer two of the, uh, just the internet stack or the network stack. Um, so it allows us to do some, some interesting things. Um, like um, it has nice multicast support, it uh, and uh, other other groups use different kinds of, of protocols that have different advantages. They they might be easier to use, they might be easier to configure. Um, um, the some of the, the uh, meshing protocols out there are uh, are currently being developed, and like there's some new ones out there that are under testing. There's one called BMX six, which is uh, very new, and uh, there's this uh, event that happens um, once a year, I think, or sometimes twice a year. Uh, it's called the Battle Mesh, where people meet and they test all of these protocols against each other to try to figure out which one is the best one for a certain scenario, and they set out all these different scenarios. And um, it hasn't been one in the US yet, but we're kind of planning to make one happen in, uh, in Oakland uh, in the near future. So. If, uh, if you keep your eyes peeled for that, it would be interesting. People just kind of hang out, hack on things, and test all the new stuff and talk about it. Um, okay. So uh, I was just at the end. So bad mesh is an um, amazing event because uh, even if it's a battle, in fact, you get all these communities to come together, which are developing different routing protocols. Uh, and uh, in fact, share knowledge and experience. They say, hey, we implemented this feature because we had this use case, and then others learn about that. And then they think, okay, how we could do that in similar way? So it's more like cross-pollination between, between a project, not so much uh, competition. And I think that's, that's a very good example of what is happening in the mesh community as a global movement, is this uh, sharing of experiences. For example, um, we started the network in, in Slovenia in 2009, and we learned from from uh, Ocean, uh, from Foyer um, network, how to do that. But then we noticed that some, something doesn't work. For example, we, we had issues, issues connecting people. And so we added, for example, this feature of, of VPNs. Now I moved here, I, I met peop, um, uh, folk from, um, from Auckland, and I shared this knowledge further. And they are building it on and adding more ideas, uh, trying different routing protocols, and so on. So I think th this 
this nature of of of, of sharing is is really amazing in in mesh communities and i uh, so maybe that, that's what i would like to talk about also about the community aspect of of mesh network the mesh network is not just a technological stack of technologies but it's really a community on different levels so it's you have a global community which you know develops networks all around the world and wherever you come if you meet with a community uh, community mesh networks people you will see that they share similar values and similar ideas and they're immediately friends with you and so on it's an amazing feeling and 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 same then as, as at, at, at lower or lower um, uh, smaller uh, layers for example in in um, cities or in communities as such. so like the community mesh network doesn't mean uh, mesh network for community but also mesh network because it is a community so you you meet together and and, and become a community you can add to that too yeah, I'm just seeing from Mark that we missed a slide or two because we've been trying to combine all of our contributions mm. into one. Um, but uh, in order to to participate in the open source aspect of the global mesh community, it's important to document all the things. So uh, we heavily emphasize, we, we have weekly hack nights. This is Oakland anyway, different from yeah. how you guys do it. but. Uh, weekly hack nights where we keep an etherpad open and we go around and give updates. We write down all the updates. We have a link dump um, and then we put it all into a wiki and the wiki page is linked to uh, deeper vaults of uh, documentation, uh, linked to the GitHub documentation and so on. So, uh, mm -hmm. um, yeah, documentation is huge uh, and participation on, on the mailing list. There's a, there's obviously uh, an issue with oversubscription to mailing lists uh, that can be a little uh, uh, overwhelming at times, but uh, I found it more uh, fruitful than debilitating to be subscribed to pretty much every mesh network mailing list there is. Mm -hmm. uh, did you want to add further to this? Yeah, a little bit. Um, I just wanted to also uh, talk about um, the forking and how forking as a pattern can be really beneficial. and. Um, we want to make what we do as forkable as, as possible. Not just the software, but everything. The wiki, the documentation, the legal documents that we use to set up a 501c3 nonprofit, everything. And our goal is to have, for all information at least, a script that you can run that will rebrand, fork and rebrand. So we have a, um, this is based on advice from Slovenia, from Mitar, um, mm -hmm. that we set up two different, uh, we, we basically have, to have two organizations. One is not really even an organization, it's the network. So the network in, in Oakland is called People's Open Network or peoplesopen.net. But we have Pseudomesh, which is the group that is actually the five one, becoming the 501c3. And uh, it's, the, it's where we develop the firmware. So it's like the Pseudomesh firmware. But you don't need to use our firmware. We don't, you don't need to use our software. You don't need anything from us in order to go um, and be part of the network. If you know what you're doing, if you wanna geek out about it, if you just don't like what we're doing, you can take our software, take someone else's software, connect to the mesh, and the only thing you need to do in order to be part of People's Open Network is agree to the network license, which is something that is in development as a collaboration between mesh groups around the world, and it's not quite done yet, but there are some drafts online, and the idea is to have a, a peering agreement, it's kind of like ISPs have between each other, but have it be more like a license where there's some principles, and then there's a legal code that implements the principles of freedom, like, like a free software license. And as long as everyone applies that license, agrees to that license, you can route traffic freely across the network. And of course, those principles are stuff like network neutrality. Yeah, that's gone through a few iterations. There's, there's already uh, the PICO peering agreement, which many networks around the world use. Um, what uh, Isaac and uh, folks from GifiNet, which is a huge network in Spain, Catalonia, uh, is uh, they're working on, uh, and us as well, a uh, network commons license, or uh, we're thinking of changing the name to uh, the nearly free network license, <laughs> um, since uh, it's uh, an almost insurmountable task to have a truly free network top to bottom, um, and the blocker there is uh, principally the hardware element. So I would suggest that we open up to questions, and so, yeah. So what about, I know this is focused a lot on sharing the internet, but what about 
routing and discovery for peer. Like my neighbor has a, a server. I probably shouldn't need to hit like DNS and hit the mm -hmm. internet just to be able to find him. Yeah. So uh, the question was, uh, we, are, we talked a lot about uh, internet sharing, uh, but what about uh, discovery in the network? Uh, so if you find a service, if your neighbor has a service, uh, how to find that? So that's one good, uh, good, good um, uh, use case of Batman. Batman is there too. Uh, protocol so which allows um, uh, multicast self discovery. So if you are in the same network, even with VPNs, you become part of the same network. You can find uh, services which are announced by others. Uh, yeah. So uh, for for the pseudo mesh for the people's open network, we are developing uh, a Node.js app that uses mm -hmm. uh, multicast DNS and DNS service discovery. You might know it as zero configuration networking or uh, Bonjour from Apple or Rendezvous. Um, but it's uh, it's a way that you can on a local network um, announce and discover services. And in fact, it's a way that Apple um, discovers printers and uh, discovers that other people are running a chat app so you can just chat with them. And a lot of this magic stuff that Apple does, uh, discovery, is based on this. Um, so we uh, so, it's, so it's standardized. There's, there's RFCs that describe this and there's open source software to implement it. Um, and we did basically just made a Node.js app that you can either run yourself or you can just go to the website that runs it on the mesh and it'll show you all services running that are tagged with being public mesh applications. Um, and this is, uh, this is under development, it works, but it's very early days. It was, I think, a few weeks ago, the first like really stable version was, was up, or at least usable version. <laughs> uh, and of course, you can do also simple things like having an index of services in the network and so on. So for example, in Athens, they have uh, their big network of multi thousand nodes, and they have their own internal Google and internal YouTube and internal services uh, uh, VoIP is one of very um, regularly made deployed services inside of the mesh network and so on. So you can really deploy. It's like really like it depends how the community wants to do it. Like it can do it through like a community portal where they list all the services. It can do it through auto um, discovery and so on. Any question um, about the Portland mesh network? Yes. Have you done any research into what it would take to get connected to NWAX? I haven't. C can you repeat the question? I, oh, yes. So uh, the uh, the question was uh, if we've investigated connecting to the NWACs, which is the, the local exchange. And no, we haven't. Um, I'm aware that they exist, uh, but I don't know the right people and how we would have to get on their roof. Uh, so there would be some costs involved. And, you know, we're a we're a volunteer-based nonprofit, and we don't raise any money, and we don't spend any money generally. But you know, if we could do that, that would be awesome, and I would love to be able to do that. So if anybody has any insight in how we could make that happen, I'd really like to know about it. So some of this is sort of, gee, maybe I can kind of get, some people can get off of their ISPs because they go to the mesh network and get onto a, an access point that will connect them to an exit code in yeah. the big world. But right now, I think particularly for realize that people having you know, ISPs are kind of like this is just out of the goodness of your heart, you're going to share part of your, yeah. your internet connection. If you turn that around, you're on the street, phone call comes in, you've got to get out of your laptop, you pull over, you open it up. How do you know that the service you're going through doesn't have big bad somebody on the yeah. other end? I mean, how, how do you establish the trust? I can understand the trust for me having mm -hmm. a router, not wanting folks in looking around at my private internal, you know, my, my local land. I, but I don't know how, turning the converse, how do I know that I'm talking to somebody who's good hearted and sharing in that stuff? I can tell you, so the question was how does the user who uses the mesh network or open wireless uh, can trust the network? And in, uh, answer to this is they should not trust the network. They, you should yeah. never trust the network. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Are you using your <laughs> home ISP or are you using community uh, uh, provider or access or open wireless, you should not never trust the network because you, you don't know you know, maybe we were forced to do at the back door, maybe somebody's hacking in between, you cannot do that. If you want to protect yourself, you have to do the end-to-end -end encryption, protect yourself, that's the only way. What the community networks can provide is access to the internet, and, and for security and privacy, you have to make it yourself. That's the only way how you can trust. And yet to, to address uh, security 
concerns on the end user level also we have uh, we host monthly crypto parties at Pseudorum, the hacker space and I encourage uh, folks who are interested in security and know a bit about it to start hosting crypto parties uh, it's been a it's just to just to hold that space um, and will up here in front uh, holds that space with me every month at Pseudorum. Uh, just to hold that space for people to come in and ask questions and to do one-on-one -on -one trainings with folks and have workshops and just show people how to protect uh, things from their level, uh, from where they are. Question over here. Um, two things. One, I host crypto parties here in Portland at Free Geek on the first Saturday of every month. <laughs> come talk to me if you're interested in helping out. Awesome. Uh, the um, second uh, question, or the only question I guess is, uh, I'm curious of if, if you know of any efforts to kind of cover that last mile from the exit node to the internet, because it seems like there's always going to have to be a step that has to go over the local ISP. Even if you're running on like a local exchange, you have to have those exit nodes connected to that. And if there are any efforts to try to get rid of that like last mile. Well, that was the same question mm -hmm. he asked. Oh, okay. So, yeah. I mean, basically, yeah. So it's basically. Repeat the question. Yeah, so the question again is, um, uh, how you how you cut out the mid, the last mile provider, and by going straight to the internet exchange. And he was asking about NWAX, which is a the, one of the local internet. You know, it's in the Pittock building. So if you get in there, you just you know click. You got Ethernet right into somebody's switch. So, uh, of course, another approach is that we grow as a global mesh community so far that we have connections between all the cities over wireless mesh. So for example, we did this in Slovenia, we have international wireless things with Croatia and Austria. So we are not just uh, going over the last mile, we are going over the last 100 miles <laughs> to the next uh, uh, country. So, and they have mesh networks there as well. So in the long term, yeah, we can do that also on the global scale. Um, probably depends on your government. So the question is the, 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 uh, about international links. I just mentioned, uh, you know, do the secret services do f put the foil there, or like how they does the government like these links? I think that here, the answer is, I think I'm not sure that they know about that yet. Um, at least in our case, and um, um, yeah, it depends on the government and and what you're doing. Um, and but I, I don't think uh, like our experience in general in, in government was that. It is quite positive feedback. Like they liked um, the the thing that uh, you know we are reaching to the people. Often commercial uh, ISPs cannot reach or don't want to reach, uh, and so on. So we we have some service in as a, uh, for the community, and I think that's important to remember here that we are doing some something good, uh, common good, and and that's a very valued um, you know a strong um, tool to use when you lever have to leverage. And, maybe local m municipality level or, or government level, uh, you, you can use that and, and you can change things. Like you can work together with municipality to, to get maybe sub subsidize or, or access to the roofs uh, owned by municipality or even at the government level to maybe legalize or, or, or make um, regulations for you easier. So that's doable in Europe. We, 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 we did that a uh, few times and it's, yeah, it depends on like, of course, the size and how much involvement you can get. Just a quick follow-up. Um, there, are, there are definitely some challenges when it comes to laws and, and, and governments. And I think uh, the, the more shadier parts of the government, they would rather survey you than shut you down. Though there are, of course, places like China where they do have censorships and they do shut you down. Um, I think another thing that people have to worry about that we haven't talked about is uh, logging directives, uh, laws that require ISPs to log. That's scary because then are we, are we just building something that's helping the government? And uh, at what point do we say we don't even want to do this anymore? Um, and I, I've investigated a little bit from my home country of Denmark that do have laws like that, but they, they, they actually do have exceptions if you're not servicing more than a certain number of, of users, and they have exceptions if, it's, if you're not making money on it. So uh, sometimes you'll find loopholes in those laws. Oh. Not building hardware. We're we, we flashing, oh, repurposing. Yeah. Like repurposing open mesh uh, hardware. Like if you could flash that with yeah. Your stuff. yeah. So the question was 
uh, repurposing open mesh hardware. So the point is, uh, you can reuse any hardware which supports open diversity. That that's currently open uh, mesh is good. Uh, what you go, do open mesh runs open diversity by itself already. So it, that's that's definitely good uh, hardware choice. Uh, there are TP links which are very cheap, twenty dollars. Uh, like that's this entry level equipment, and then you have ubiquity equipment, which is for example. Uh, like this, eighty dollars, uh, which uh, which is interesting because it's already in, in the enclosure, which you, you can put outside. Yeah. So this is getting a little technical and detailed, but I just I've, we've had some people come go get really excited and go out and buy hardware, and I, I don't want people to buy hardware that's bad if they could get better hardware for the same cost. If you're buying something, you want to play with this, get something with an Aetheros chipset, mm -hmm. get something that has at least eight megabytes of flash memory and at least 32 megabytes of RAM. Yes. If you do that, you're going to be great. You're going to have really good piece of hardware. And it's not that that's more expensive. You just have to look at the specs a little bit. Yes. All right. So I think we have to, we have to finish. Yeah. So I would just add, uh, we can talk more after this. Uh, just come to us. And also online, we are all online. We have many clips. Uh, feel free to subscribe to, like for example, Oakland Man Man Mesh Magnets. And even if you're here, feel free to ask okay. questions about how to do this. We are we are really here to spread this and help you. So with any, at any level, from how to do community, how to do mesh, how to do hardware, how, what to buy, a, any question, yeah. just really come and, and ask and join our IC channel, wiki, whatever. Mm, you yeah. want to hand it to Russell yeah. to oh. um, maybe announce when the oh, PC so uh, there was we have weekly meetings as well, Wednesday evenings at about 6.30. The location moves around a little bit, so you need to check our, our wiki or get on our mailing list or something. Do you, do you want to announce the crypto party as well? It wasn't announced on the microphone. Oh. So when is the crypto party? It's at 3.30 on the first uh, Saturday. 3.30 on, at, on the first Saturday of every month at Free Geek. Yes. Yes. Can I suggest that you announce this on the mailing list of uh, personal telco as well? Mm -hmm. And then uh, uh, we also have a, a little bit of swag, thanks to Will. Made some awesome buttons, uh, Mesh the Planet logo and uh, Grumpy Cat. and. Uh, some other excellent choices. So, I think there's only a couple left. But you've been distributing them over the course so, of the conference. Be quick, be quick. <laughs> Thank you. Mm.